and we'll see we'll see how this goes just check our, our man here's good to go are we are we good to go all right so um hello i'm neil i work on the core team at matrix uh, this is kind of going to be a, a sort of intro to matrix it's going to be a little bit about what we've built to date uh, what, what exists in the wild uh, and what we're going to do next. What's the next, the next big thing that we're going to do? Um, for questions, uh, if you've got questions, just ask them as we go. It's a small group, so we can just, we can just do that. Um, the folks over the side, you can't see on the cameras. Um, there's some uh, physical body games going on. It's going to be a little bit uh, disorientating while that's happening, but I think it'll be done in 10 minutes. Um, that's it. Shall we dive in? So, just before I do dive in, I know some of you are new to Matrix. Is that is that true of everyone, or I just want to get a sense of uh, just a little bit of knowledge? Okay, great. That's brilliant. Um, so uh, let's dive in then. So, um, what? That is not what I thought it was going to do. All right. Right, okay. Is this, is this going to work? Yes, good. All right, so Matrix is an open network for uh, secure, decentralized, real-time communication. So you can use this for interoperable chat, interoperable VoIP, uh, you can use it for um, uh, virtual reality, and uh, basically anything where um, you want to just synchronize blobs of JSON around the internet in the decentralized, eventually consistent kind of manner. So something that's uh, a really good use case for that is interoperable chat, and that's really what I'm going to be talking about mostly here. Um, we have a mission statement, which is a bit more detail, and it's, I'll, I'll just read it out. It's to create uh, a global, decentralized, encrypted comms network that provides an open platform for real-time communication. And this is a bit abstract. I'm going to talk in a bit more concrete terms in just a moment. Um, but while we're on this sort of uh, high-level, more philosophical thing, let's just talk a little bit about uh, we have a manifesto, and I just want to talk about those kind of values that underpin the project because it helps to sort of describe why the hell we get out of bed in the morning and do this stuff. Uh, so the first thing is uh, we believe people should have full control over their communications. Uh, we don't want people to get locked into centralized silos. We just think that's, that's kind of awful for something so personal. We think people should be able to converse securely and privately as a, as a human right. And uh, the UN actually, in their um, European um, Bill of Human Rights, does actually talk about communication, but it does not talk about private communication. And we think that's really sad. Uh, and then the final thing, um, we think that communication should be free and open. It should be unencumbered. Um, and it should be access to a standard network. All right. So that's. That's quite hard, I think, to, 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 to really get involved with. Let's think about something a little bit more practical. If you think about email, start with email. If I want to send an email to someone, I don't care if they're on Gmail or ProtonMail or Yahoo Mail. I can just send to them, and I can use a particular service provider. I can probably use whatever client I want to use. Um, and I can hit send, and it, and it can happen. Um, and, and I simply don't care who I'm sending it to and why, because it's an open standard and everyone implements the same standard. If I don't like my provider because they go evil or I just don't like them one day, uh, I can move and I can migrate and my data is portable. I have to change my email address, which is a shame, but by and large, I'm not locked in in any way at all and I've got a lot of freedom. And this makes for really valuable, durable networks. If there was an email that someone sent in the late 70s, you could load that up in a modern email client today and you could still read it. If you contrast that with instant messaging, the whole landscape is completely different. Um, you know, maybe people have here, maybe you have five, six different messengers on your phone right now. You kind of have to remember to speak to this person, you use this service, to speak to this person, you use this service. Um, and it's, it's just, it's just there's lots of very centralized um, siloed communication nodes, for want of a better word. Now, this is kind of annoying on the first instance because you just have to remember, but it's not the end of the world and we can, you know, we can all just about deal with it. But there's something really important about this because if I cannot leave a given uh, messaging app, then because I lose access to my social graph and I'm kind of trapped there and I cannot move away. So if that service were to change somehow and to, uh, I don't know, start trying to advertise to me due to on my metadata, 
or uh, wanted to sort of weaken the encryption of that service or whatever, some reason I didn't like it, I cannot leave. And for a user, that's really, really, really bad news. Uh, and I think that is bad. So this is one of the reasons why Matrix exists. It tries to interoperate across lots and lots of other different protocols. Uh, it tries to uh, create this open standard that others could also implement if they wish to. Um, and that's basically what we've tried to build out over the past few years. So pictorially, if you imagine this, and there's a whole bunch of communication networks that you've got right here, um, make sure it kind of sits in the middle and interoperates, interoperates between them. This, this whole idea we call bridging, um, it's not the main focus of what we're doing, but it is a very important aspect of Matrix, and it's very important philosophically of what we're trying to achieve. It's worth pointing out, though, you know, if you're on Slack and you want to talk to your friend on Telegram, you, you're always limited to the, the lowest common denominator of the protocols involved. So if you're on Slack, you know, this is not going to be an end-to-end -end encrypted chat because Slack can't do that. Uh, and so it's always important to remember that when you're thinking about bridging. So digging into matrix itself, and so this is really kind of the, the middle bit of that, of that diagram, how this actually plays out is you have these home servers in the middle, which are um, really the, the sort of core, core of the protocol. These are the things that are doing all the synchronization. This is, they are entirely, this is an entirely decentralized network and protocol. You have clients that connect into given home servers. The application servers are, are the things that talk to bridges and let you talk out of the network. And then finally, you have identity servers, which are basically phone books and allow you to map third-party identifiers like email addresses or phone numbers if you want it um, to f help you find people within Matrix. You don't need to use an identity server to use Matrix. You can be entirely anonymous if you so wish. But the one thing that's really, really important to think about with Matrix um, versus lots of other messaging technologies is this is not a message passing framework. Sorry, I'll shout, uh, shout as loud as I can. <laughs> this is not a message passing framework. This is, um, this is something that synchronizes conversation history. And what, that's completely by design. And what it means is if one of these home servers disappears for two weeks, they just go away and then comes back. That person on that home server just resynchronizes in conversation, can pull everything in, they don't miss a thing, um, and they can just carry on talking as if they hadn't been away. And it's a really, really important thing to understand about Matrix, but really what we're doing is creating an eventually consistent conversation history synchronization fabric. Um, and this is really this, this idea. No single party owns your communications. Conversation is shared across all participants. So if, the, if there's three people having a, a, a conversation, there's no central point of control where that conversation lives. It lives equally across each of those three nodes. Any questions on that bit? Because it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of core to the whole, the whole protocol. Uh, sorry? What does it mean when you say they're shared over all participants? Oh, so. Uh, yeah, so the question is, what does it mean that they're shared over, uh, the information is shared over all participants? Uh, and yes, the answer is very much, uh, it's replicated across all participants uh, in an eventually consistent manner. So it's decentralized, we have consensus algorithms at place, um, but we're not doing sort of blockchain-y type stuff. It can be eventually consistent when everyone catches up. And that, that's kind of an acceptable trade-off when you're producing a chat app versus a, a, you know, a financial uh, instrument. All right, so that's a kind of whistle top store of what Matrix is supposed to be. I just want to talk about how we actually use this stuff in the wild um, and how people are actually getting value out of this kind of technology. Um, so I'm going to start with a bit of a history uh, of the project. Uh, we got going in kind of 2014 um, and really got things to the point where they could federate um, um, and, and bridge into other protocols. We started with IRC because that's where we all grew up. Um, we also launched a, a, a client, um, which looks, um, I mean, clients into Matrix look like things like WhatsApp or look like things like Slack. If, that, if you have that mental image, that's roughly where it is. I'll actually demo some of this to you in a moment um, so you can actually see it. But um, 2015, that's kind of where we were at. We had something that sort of federated, sort of worked. We had a decent client, uh, and we were starting to get some interest in the project. People started using this stuff. 2016, people really sort of came to the table, and we got very busy trying to scale it. 
uh, we wanted to add end-to-end -end encryption because you know if you're going to have a federated, a decentralized communication system where you're you are synchronizing all these conversations, um, you really need end-to-end -end encryption because otherwise your data is going everywhere, and you don't you and, and, you, and you, you you might not want to share that. Um, we also re renamed Vector the client at the time to Riot because marketing. 2017, we hit a few problems. Uh, we uh, were struggling to fund the project, and uh, as is always the case in that situation, we did shiny, shiny things, and we made sticker packs, and we did video conferencing, and we created um, a sense of communities where you could group rooms together, and just generally things that we could talk about. Um, as a technique, this worked, and we got ourselves in a much more stable position in 2018, where we just stopped everything and focused really on security and stability and governance of the project and just try to get all the foundation fundamentals just right. That work paid off and in 2019 we released a 1.0 and that basically just means we think this is ready for very serious production use. So that's our history. Um, and this is to give you an idea of sort of the growth of the network. This is daily active users on the public federation. Um, it goes back and starts in 2016. 2018, you'll remember I kept talking about stability and uh, performance and security stuff. That is, our, that is our summer of discontent right there. Uh, and we had to work real hard to fix it. And as soon as we did, we started uh, uh, boosting up again. Uh, and then this one just shows people's nodes on the network. Any person at this, in, this, in this circle, if you want to run your own matrix node, you can. You just, it's all open source. You can just run it yourself. You join the Open Federation. No one says you can't. Um, this is, this is only the number of people that will tell us about themselves. Lots of people run their uh, home servers dark. We think there's probably about double this number in the wild. Uh, and then here's just a bunch of stats. Uh, I won't dwell too long on it. Um, but what I want to point out is there are about 400 different projects building on top of Matrix. There's the kind of core teams projects, which produce clients like Riot. Um, but there's just a huge number of clients and bots and bridges out there that the community are, are, are providing. And one of the reasons for that is we work really, really hard to make it easy to build on top of Matrix. The server tech's quite hard to work on, um, but the client stuff ought to be, we try and do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, and I'll try and demonstrate how easy that is towards the end of this talk. Um, and we think there's about 70 companies building on top of Matrix right now. What about France? I hear you say. Did anyone say that? What about France? What about France? Of course, of course. So the French government had a fantastic uh, open government initiative. Um, and a few years ago, they said, well, they really, really want to, um, we want our technology to be open. We, want, we really want to dive into this. And we want to rip up a whole bunch of stuff that we, have, that we have today. And one of the key things, actually, that drove this was they realized that a lot of senior ministers, senior civil servants, we're using things like WhatsApp or Telegram to, to communicate and do their, do their business. And I guess they thought, well, you know, it's end-to-end -end encrypted, so it's safe for me to do this, and that's, that's true. But that metadata is incredibly, incredibly valuable. So for instance, if you think about uh, the UK right now, if you knew what every single member of parliament, uh, who they were talking to, not even the contents, just the metadata of who was talking to who, you could probably start to say quite a lot of very serious things about British politics and what was just about to happen. So if Jeremy Corbyn and Boris Johnson started furiously WhatsApping each other at three o'clock this morning, you might be able to say, you might be able to infer um, that, that, that that was significant. So, so the president said, well, this is not a good situation. We need this to be self-sovereign. We don't want uh, something as important as uh, instant messaging information to leave, to leave our jurisdiction. We want to bring this in-house, but we want this to be uh, an open source project. We want it to be decentralized because we are a government. And, uh, it, might not, it wasn't immediately obvious to us when we started this whole project, but because governments have a lot of structure, you have, you have ministries within, depart, within a government, and they might not, uh, they want to interoperate and talk to each other, but they might not you know, want to do things the same way as each other, they might not even trust each other very much. So actually having a decentralized network to model that sort of, uh, how, how government departments talk to each other actually works really, really well. Um, so they came to us in 2018 um, and basically said, we need this to be self-sovereign, we want it to be encrypted and we want it to be decentralized and it has to be 100% open source. Uh, and enormous credit to them for doing this and really, and really living that. You can go and look at all the code for, uh, for this, it's, it's on GitHub. Um, everything is there. The only thing that isn't there are some of the um, uh, Ansible playbooks of how we actually deployed it into their systems. So well, naturally that, that bit isn't public, but everything else, all the technology that they're running is there and you can go and look at it and watch us working on it. 
Um, and there were five and a half million French civil servants, by the way. So that's a, that's a big old group. The idea is initially they want to run this internally. So it's just the way that um, government business is conducted internally. And then to the future, very excitingly, they want to make this um, be something that openly federates. So if you are a, a French citizen, the way that you can talk to your government is through um, a tool like Matrix, which is super, super cool. Matrix 1.0, what, what does this mean? Why are we excited about it? And why am I sort of jumping up and down about this? Um, so, as I said, this was really about us getting to the point where we felt that we had enough components that we could really look someone in the eye and say, this is ready for production use. And if you like all of these properties, if you like the fact that it's decentralized, you like the encryption, then, then you can really put some very serious things on this. Um, and you know, French government example is a pretty good case study. If they're using it, um, then we feel as long as we, we, we flesh out all the extra use cases that they don't care about, then we've got something really, really powerful. So our sort of history was start off right in the beginning, just make it work. 1.0 was really this sort of, let's make it work right. Let's actually make this be really, really secure in every case. And now we've moved into a new phase where it's just make this wonderful and make it fast and make it, make, make it deeply excellent. So I'm going to just jump through some of the things that went into our 1.0. Um, but at the core of Matrix, the thing that's probably the hardest uh, part of it is the consensus algorithm. Um, and it's really hard to get right. Uh, we, we put up with something that was very good at uh, uh, achieving consensus. It, it worked in that regard. But sometimes the way that rooms would achieve consensus, uh, it was counterintuitive to a human. Things, weird things happened. It was mathematically correct, um, but it was just weird and people didn't like it and we didn't like it. So we had a good old go at uh, fixing that and we're now very happy with it. Um, I'm not going to go down this whole list. Um, uh, I'm just going to jump forward. But uh, I think some of these items are probably more interesting if you've sort of really lived and breathed some of the pain points that, um, that they threw up. But fundamentally, we got to the point where we're saying we, we really believe in our protocol. We think this is solid. We have no known security items open with it. Um, and uh, we're very happy. And then we've gone to, uh, we've done 1.0. Let's, uh, let's go and have some fun with this stuff. Um, at the same time, um, governance, that's kind of important. We were a young protocol, but we didn't really have a formal governance structure. And lots of companies were starting to build on Matrix. So we needed something that was neutral. Um, and the way that we did that, we have eight people who uh, manage the technical aspects of the spec. And they basically are in charge of making sure that's going in the right direction. And then we have five guardians who are um, not, uh, I mean, there's the two founders of the project, but then three, three others. Um, who are completely neutral and we're really just there to hold the rest of us to account and really say, you know, is what you're doing actually for the, for the greater good here and just make sure that we don't get strong-armed by one of the companies building on top of Matrix um, and just basically keeping us, keeping us honest. Um, right, so I'm again going to skip over, I think, some of this stuff. Since 1.0, which is in the summer, we've just worked really, really, really hard to make this stuff work fast. And in particular, um, you, know, you imagine as I described Matrix, it's, it's basically a network of, uh, of servers. Um, we run the largest, it's matrix.org, uh, and this is really to kind of bootstrap the project. But the skills and the uh, characteristics of that piece of software, it, it's all tuned for being a really large instance. And most people, what we actually want people to do is run their own servers. So we spend a lot of time, and they're still spending a lot of time right now, trying to think about that small use case. You're running it on a Raspberry Pi, you're running it on a very low-powered VPS. How can we make this be a really, really nice experience for you? So you don't have to rely on matrix.org, you don't have to trust us, you can just, you can just own, own your own data. Um, and this is just a graph to show how hard we've been working on performance. If you think uh, this is response time, sending messages, um, over the summer we were kind of somewhere awful on matrix.org between one and three seconds, which is just terrible. Um, and then more recently, we're now sort of sub, sub, sub 50 milliseconds to send a message. And we think that that's an acceptable place to be. Bear in mind, this is the most heavily loaded largest instance on the Federation. If you're just running your own personal one, it's going to go really fast anyway, because it won't be so loaded. Uh, other stuff that we've been building into it, things like edits and reactions. We've thrown away our Android app. If you've used Matrix and you've used the Android app, please check out Riot X. Um, it's a complete reimagining of how, of how you build a matrix client, and we think it's super cool. Um, we've made it really easy now to verify people for E2E encryption. Um, we uh, have a, ser a service called Pantalimon, which means that bots can start to talk our end-to-end -end protocol without having to actually go and implement that. 
uh, we are bridging into uh, XMPP, which is a new bridge for us. Uh, we're thinking about, we use HTTP as our main transport today. We think we could do better, and we've been experimenting with new transports that require less bandwidth. Uh, and finally, cross-signing E2E devices. Matrix is really thinking about group chats. So if you imagine the situation where today, you, you know, if I have three devices, and maybe you have three devices, I just want to verify that you are you. Um, and I don't want to have to verify each, each of your devices. And that's what cross-signing buys us. Um, we've also spent a bunch of time on privacy and um, uh, helping our users understand where their data is going. We have a really complex data model. Uh, you'll remember I talked earlier about the sort of phone book system that's the identity server. And those servers tend to work better when, when they're quite large and lots of people use the same one. Uh, and that's, uh, that can be quite tricky because you might not realize where your data is going as you add a phone number or you add an email to your account. So we spent a whole bunch of time trying to fix that, um, and I think we're in way, way better shape uh, um, uh, as a result. Right, let's move on. What's next? What are we going to do? I'm going to talk about this, and then I'm going to do a demo, and then we'll do some questions, and I'll come and sit down, and we'll just have a, we'll just have a chat. Um, so 2020 um, is all going to be about thinking about user experience. Um, you know, I think when we've got decentralized projects, we, we often end up with some, some really great tech, um, but it, you get to the point where you, you, can't, you can't recommend it to your friends or you can't recommend it to your non-techie friends because it's hard or it's weird or it's intimidating. And uh, this is definitely true of, uh, of Riot, our principal, uh, our sort of flagship client in, in Matrix. And we want to change that. Um, so we're going to spend a good chunk of time next year and this year trying to fix that up. We need to switch end-to-end -end encryption by default for uh, direct messages. At the moment, it's optional. Um, and we need to make it much clearer you know, what this chat actually is. Is it, is it an encrypted chat or not? Um, decentralized accounts, which basically means portability across the network. Um, launch this whole, whole Riot X thing, which is our, our brand spangly new uh, mobile client. And uh, have a little think about P2P matrix. At the moment, you have to have a home server. There's nothing in the protocol that means that, that that's the case. Um, it's just that right now, the only implementations exist on the server side. You could just implement this whole thing on the client side. We've done a few proof of concepts, nothing that we could put in production right now. And then the final thing, uh, which is very topical for the session I just came from, which is decentralized reputation. Our network is growing and growing and growing and growing. Um, topics of um, abuse management, moderation, just generally knowing where you might want to, uh, uh, who you might want to interact with. These are all hard problems to solve in a decentralized network. Uh, and we're just at the beginning of that process of trying to figure out how to solve that problem. Um, we don't have a solution for it yet. We think it's a hard problem. Right, demo time. I've kind of got two things. I'm just going to show you Riot, um, just so you can see it and all the rest. And I'm going to show you the, the room that is the decentralized groups matrix room. Um, and then I'm going to use um, the command line, and I'm going to send a message into that room. So I can show you quite how easy it would be to write a bot or a client to, to talk in that room. Um, my boss tells me that we're not allowed to do these demos without, we're not allowed to do these talks without some kind of demo. And this is, this is my uh, homage to, uh, to a demo. Um, oh, hang on. Let's not do that. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, dear. Go away. I want to show these people this great thing. Well, that's unusual. OK. Ah, yeah. OK, here we go. So this probably looks kind of familiar to anyone that's used Slack or Discord or Mattermost or any, or any of those things. Um, there's, there's, there's not too much that's exciting going on here. On the left, you've got a bunch of rooms. On the far, far left, you've got sort of communities, which are kind of like sub, like groups of rooms. So I can, you know, this is like the Matrix community, and this is our GSOC, uh, Google Summer of Code community. Um, and then on the right, I can, you know, a whole bunch of people that happen to be in this room. By the way, is anyone here in this room? Is anyone, is anyone in the re-decentralized room? No? OK, right. Um, so. If I can actually drive my computer, what I'm going to do is pull up a, um, a terminal, and I'm going to send a message on, on my behalf. That's me. That's me asking what, what on earth I should talk about in this, in this thing. Um, and uh, we'll send a message, and I'll show you how easy that is, because you can do it in a simple like curl command to do that. 
So let's do that. Um, and so all this is really just saying is, hello from Recentralized 2019. I talk about the, uh, the place I'm going to send it to, so matrix.org. Um, I'm saying what room I'm going to choose, which is this room. Uh, and I have to give an access token, which is basically how I, how I log in. So if a bit of like if I, press, if I press enter, we should see this on the left-hand side, me appearing to speak. Come on. I did test this a few minutes earlier. I'm just wondering if I've got the connectivity. I think I have. Well, that's annoying. Anyway, um, I don't know why I can't speak out. What you would have been seeing is uh, me over here appearing to, uh, um, to speak and say hello, hello from Decentralized. I'm going to leave that up in the background. Ah, right, I have lost internet connectivity, so that's a real shame. Let's just see if I can bring it up, and if not, I'll move on to something, uh, um, something else. Do I have anything? No, no Wi-Fi at all. Oh, there's looks like Wi-Fi, so let's try it again. Was it just teasing me, or have I got Wi-Fi? There it is, on the left-hand side. I wasn't lying. Brilliant. So just to explain what I've done there, um, Matrix is basically just a bunch of HTTP APIs. You can black JSON at it, and it will do stuff. In this case, I just tried to send a message, and it landed in a room, and there it appears, and Wright is rendering it for us. But the reason I wanted to show you that was to show you how extensible Matrix is and how easy it is to build on top of it. Uh, you can build a whole Matrix client in about 10 lines of bash. Um, and uh, we did this recently just to prove that that statement was true. Um, and uh, we made it a bit too, uh, too aggressive and did all sorts of bad things, but, um, but it's totally possible to do exactly that. Right, great. Oh, I've done very peculiar things there. Let's not worry about that. So my final thing, and then I want to just talk about questions. Um, just asking for help, really. Ask, imploring people, don't use proprietary services for your chat or at least understand why you're doing so. Have a little, have a, have a think about that. If you want to give Matrix a spin, the easiest possible way for you to do this is to sign up to Riot, which is at riot.im. It's all free. Just sign up and you get in and go. Uh, or there's a whole bunch of other clients. If you don't want to use the Riot client and you want something that's more terminal orientated, there's like hundreds and hundreds of clients you can use at various levels of uh, um, maturity. If you've done that and you're actually really into this, we'll have a go at running your own server. Now, this can be, this can be quite challenging and you can self-host it. Or you can use a provider like Modular, and that will self-host it for you, or host it on your behalf. And then the final thing is, have a think about, is Matrix a good fit for your organization? Either maybe a community group, or just a, a, a sort of local community thing, or maybe you're part of a much larger group. Maybe you're working for some sort of civic organization where this whole sort of data privacy uh, and very, very structured uh, org uh, comes into play. Come and have a chat with us. And we can help you migrate or advise you how to do that. Or if you want to do it piecemeal in bits and you want to, uh, you know, maybe everyone's really, really, really uh, keen on Slack and half the company are happy to go to Matrix and you want to bridge that in, a gentleman like uh, Halfshot over here um, can help you achieve that. It's, it's exactly what Matrix does. Um, and that's it. We're done. Um, no, more, no more talking from me. Just uh, questions from you until we all get bored of this, and then we can go and populate and pollinate across the, uh, across the conference. All right, so that was kind of high tempo. Um, yeah, what, can I answer any questions? Yeah. Uh, where it was infinite. Oh, oh, right, right. Oh, okay, so the question was uh, just because I'm on a mic. Um, I was just asking what on earth is going on there, and did we really have an infinite, uh, infinite session? 
I mean, I think what it's actually doing is it's between 10 seconds and infinity. So it's a, it's a log scale. Um, so it's not it wasn't actually infinite. I, I don't even know how we would how we would measure. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I think all it's really saying is, you know, because matrix.org is by far and away the largest server in, in the federation, it's under a lot of heavy load. We're continually tuning and continually tuning. It's great. Yeah, yeah, there's all sorts of, uh, um, it's a very complex system because you have the whole federation talking to it. Uh, and so this is a really, really good way to make sure that we're being honest when we say this stuff, this stuff performs because you push it to a limit, fix those limits, push it a bit more, push it a bit more, push it a bit more. The problem we always have for performance for matrix.org is every single time we hit a, uh, a wall and we smash through it, we think, great, we've got some headroom now. And then a few months later, a whole bunch of other people have joined on. So um, don't use matrix.org, run your own stuff, it will be great. Yes. Oh, okay. So, the, so the question is: initially, I was talking a bit about bridging and bridging into other chat site, um, uh, chat services, and then towards the end, I was really talking about native matrix and um, just showing showing Riot, the, the flagship client, and, and basically the. Uh, um, the user experience would be you're using Riot and you're talking to people, it appears that they are also matrix users, but they're not, and they are on IRC or on some other service. So in that uh, re-decentralized room, I don't know if that is a bridged room or not. I just wanted to check. Uh, ah, all right, okay, great. So this gentleman uh, here, Matt J, who's just, uh, who's just joined, um, is, is bridged in from XMPP. You cannot tell that you are not talking to someone on Matrix. On the other side, they may have some, you know, there may be some little like M, brackets M behind, behind my name if I was to reply. Um, but the, the idea is that you use Riot, you can talk to Matrix people. That's probably the richest experience because the protocols, you know, it's the same protocol. But you can also talk to XMPP, IRC, uh, Signal, WhatsApp, Discord, basically whatever, whatever you can imagine someone has written a bridge for it. Um, and, and, and you know, this was a way that, particularly initially, people really got to know about Matrix. They were on IRC and they just wanted to try it out, but they didn't want to have to switch the whole community over. Yeah. 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 So, so the question is, um, how does this apply to organisations? Um, lots of organisations really rely heavily on email, and this doesn't. And, and this is instant messaging, not email. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's it's a different technology. I mean, it's a much more modern technology. Um, I think email's got its place. I think instant messaging has uh, increasingly a, um, a, a just a, a concrete use case in a business setting. Uh, and you know, you only need to look at something like uh, Slack in a in a commercial setting, to to, to uh, or Microsoft Teams actually as well, which is growing even faster. Um, to show that people have a need for this kind of stuff. But if you do today, you're giving your data away to um, and to some to some centralized service. Yeah. So is that signal anywhere in the interface or do you use Oh yeah, so, so the question is, um, how can you be preaching about decentralization in the context of the French when um, you know, if someone was able to bridge into that, then you kind of have exactly the same problem and the, da and the data goes there. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a great question. The, in the way that we have set it up for the French, you cannot interoperate in. Like they, 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 ha they don't have that support there. Right, right. So, um, what what they hope to do is to uh, federate openly. So, um, someone, so from here, I could reach members of the French government. Um, but what you can't do is do that through WhatsApp. You can't bridge through WhatsApp to to, to get there. 
and that, that's just because their use case, it, as you say, it, 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 it makes no sense for them. But it might make sense for an organization that, say, was heavily on Slack today and wanted to gradually move over rather than have a big bang, sort of flip the switch, now everyone's on Matrix. So that, that, that might be a use case. Uh, oh yeah, absolutely. So the question is, can, can can you send a message to WhatsApp via Riot? Yes, you can. Absolutely. So you set up the bridge, um, and then um, it's like it's just like you're talking to anyone else. You just happen to know that they're on WhatsApp, um, and you you hit send. The only thing that's really important to remember when you're bridging. Um, oh, sorry, my uh, uh, colleagues are adding a few extra questions for me. Um, what year is it? Who's the president? Goodness. Um, when you're bridging, it's always the lowest common denominator of all those, of all those protocols. So, uh, and the other part is, um, because there's no open standard for end-to-end -end encryption yet, there will be one soon, um, there's no way to have an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation with your contact on, on WhatsApp via Matrix right now because the bridge in the middle has to decode on both sides. So once MLS is the thing and we all can agree what, what uh, that protocol looks like, then, um, then you might be able to have a truly end-to-end -end encrypted conversation cross protocol, which would be pretty awesome. That's great because I don't have WhatsApp on my, installed on my phone because I don't want to, then I have access to my contacts. Right. Uh, I could set up the with Riot and then I can send messages from Riot to WhatsApp. That's right, that's right. I mean, you, you still end up needing some access into the WhatsApp network and that does require um, a handset, but it doesn't have to be a physical handset. So you could host like an Android VM that's notionally your handset, uh, and then um, so you don't actually ever have to have that on your phone. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, so the question is, what are these? What are these things here? These are read receipts. Uh, uh, read receipts. So um, it's hard. This is a really, really big room. But if you imagine a case where you're in a room and there's say five people, it's really, really helpful. Um, you know, naturally to, to know who's read your message, and it's just a quite a nice uh, uh, visual cue. You, you you sort of see someone come online, and then you see their see their their face sort of. Drop, drop down over um, uh, over time. So that, that that's um, uh, that's what that is. It's just a sort of some some sort of visual sugar, I guess, to denote this person, Matthew, has read this message. And and, and because you get very uh, finely tuned on what everyone's avatars are, you you very quickly can sort of decode all these uh, um, all, all these all these symbols. Oh, so th so they have they have their own client. Let me uh, let me show you a shot of it. Uh, sorry. So the question was, um, in the French case, are they using Riot or are they using something else? They're using something else. They're using chat, um, and um, it is. Uh, I, I guess you could describe it as a sort of simplified client in some cases. They have, they have a more specific use case. Um, and uh, this is just a picture of it. It probably resembles WhatsApp more than it resembles Slack, I, I, I would say. Uh, and that, that, just, that just sort of suits their, their case. They also have some uh, color coding for various security zones. So if you are talking to someone um, very senior in government, say, uh, there's a sort of visual prompt to remind you that that's that you're in this zone or in this other zone. If you're in a more uh, public area, you can tell very very quickly, and that's just helpful for them. Um, you know, just from how people are using the, um, uh, the app. And you know, they also have a whole bunch of extra um, uh, specific rules around uh, who can invite who to a chat. So, uh, who can invite who to a conversation? So you can't. You go in as the the most junior administrator and be DMing Macron on day one. Uh, like you know, there's, there's there's some they've got some extra rules around that kind of stuff, which I think you need in an organisation of that sort of size. 
All right, well, look, thank you. It was a bit, was a bit noisy at times, so thank you for sticking through with it. Um, I'm going to wrap this up, but if you have any one-on-one -on -one questions, please do come and have a chat. Um, and as I say, try out Riot, give it a go. If it's great, wonderful. If it's terrible, come tell me about it. Um, you can reach me uh, 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 here. This is my Matrix ID right there. Uh, and I'm on Twitter at Neil is Fragile. Uh, and just tell, if it's no good, I want to know why, because that's what we're trying to fix. That's what we're trying to solve right now. All right, thank you very much, everyone.